A gladiator was an armed combatant who entertained audiences in the Roman Republic and Roman Empire in violent confrontations with other gladiators, wild animals, and condemned criminals. Some gladiators were volunteers who risked their lives and their legal and social standing by appearing in the arena. Most were despised as slaves, schooled under harsh conditions, socially marginalized, and segregated even in death. Irrespective of their origin, gladiators offered spectators an example of Rome's martial ethics and, in fighting or dying well, they could inspire admiration and popular acclaim. They were celebrated in high and low art, and the value as entertainers was commemorated in precious and commonplace objects throughout the Roman world. The origin of gladiatorial combat is open to debate. There is evidence of it in funeral rites during the Punic Wars of the 3rd century BC, and thereafter it rapidly became an essential feature of politics and social life in the Roman world. Its popularity led to its use in ever more lavish and costly games. The gladiator games lasted for nearly a thousand years, reaching their peak between the 1st century BC and the 2nd century AD. The games finally declined during the early 5th century after the adoption of Christianity as state church of the Roman Empire in 380, although beast hunts continued into the 6th century. History Origins Early literary sources seldom agree on the origins of gladiators and the gladiator games. In the late 1st century BC, Nicolaus of Damascus believed they were Etruscan. A generation later, Livy wrote that they were first held in 310 BC by the Campanians in celebration of their victory over the Samnites, long after the games had ceased. The 7th century AD writer Isidore of Seville derived Latin lanista from the Etruscan word for executioner and the title of Carreran from Charon. Psychopomp of the Etruscan underworld, Roman historians emphasize the gladiator games as a foreign import, most likely Etruscan. This preference informed most standard histories of the Roman games in the early modern era. Reappraisal of the evidence supports a Campanian origin, or at least de borrowing, for the games and gladiators. The earliest known Roman gladiator schools were in Campania. Tomb frescoes from Pistum show paired fighters, with helmets, spears and shields. In a propitiatory funeral blood rite that anticipates early Roman gladiator games. Compared to these images, supporting evidence from Etruscan tomb paintings is tentative and late. The Pistum frescoes may represent the continuation of a much older tradition, acquired or inherited from Greek colonists of the 8th century BC. Livy dates the earliest Roman gladiator games to 264 BC, in the early stages of Rome's first Punic War against Carthage. Decimus Iunius Brutus Scaeva had three gladiator pairs fight to the death in Rome's cattle market forum to honor his dead father, Brutus Pera. This is described as a munus, a commemorative duty owed the manes of a dead ancestor by his descendants. The gladiator type used was Thracian, but the development of the munus and its gladiator types was most strongly influenced by Samnium's support for Hannibal and subsequent punitive expeditions by Roman and her Campanian allies. The earliest and most frequently mentioned type was the Samnite. The war in Samnium, immediately afterwards, was attended with equal danger and an equally glorious conclusion. The enemy, besides their other warlike preparation, had made their battle line to glitter with new and splendid arms. There were two corps. The shields of the one were inlaid with gold, of the other with silver. The Romans had already heard of these splendid accoutrements, but their generals had taught them that a soldier should be rough to look on, not adorned with gold and silver but putting his trust in iron and in courage. The dictator, as decreed by the Senate, celebrated a triumph, in which by far the finest show was afforded by the captured armor. So the Romans made use of the splendid armor of their enemies to do honor to their gods, while the Campanians, in consequence of their pride and in hatred of the Samnites, Equipped after this fashion, the gladiators who furnished them entertainment at their feasts, 
and bestowed on them the name Psalmonites. Livy's account skirts the funereal, sacrificial function of early Roman gladiator combat and underlines the later theatrical ethos of the gladiator show. Splendidly, exotically armed and armored barbarians, treacherous and degenerate, are dominated by Roman iron and native courage. His plain Romans virtuously dedicate the magnificent spoils of war to the gods. Their Campanian allies stage a dinner entertainment using gladiators who may not be Sam Knights, but play the Sam Knight role. Other groups and tribes would join the cast list as Roman territories expanded. Most gladiators were armed and armored in the manner of the enemies of Rome. The Munus became a morally instructive form of historic enactment in which the only honorable option for the gladiator was to fight well, or else die well. Development in 216 BC, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, late consul in Augur, was honored by his sons with three days of gladiator immunera in the Forum Romanum, using 22 pairs of gladiators. Ten years later, Scipio Africanus gave a commemorative munis in Iberia for his father and uncle, casualties in the Punic Wars. High-status non-Romans, and possibly Romans too, volunteered as his gladiators. The context of the Punic Wars and Rome's near-disastrous defeat at the Battle of Cannae linked these early games to munificence. The celebration of military victory and the religious expiation of military disaster, these munera appear to serve the morale-raising agenda in an era of military threat and expansion. The next recorded Munus, held for the funeral of Publius Licinius in 183 BC, was more extravagant. It involved three days of funeral games, 120 gladiators, and public distribution of meat, a practice that reflected the gladiatorial fights at Campanian banquets described by Livy and later deplored by Silius Italicus. The enthusiastic adoption of gladiatoria munera by Rome's Iberian allies shows how easily, and how early, the culture of the gladiator munus permeated places far from Rome itself. By 174 BC, small Roman munera, provided by an editor of relatively low importance, may have been so commonplace and unremarkable they were not considered worth recording. Many gladiatorial games were given in that year, some unimportant. One noteworthy beyond the rest, that of Titus Flamininus which he gave to commemorate the death of his father, which lasted four days, and was accompanied by a public distribution of meats, a banquet, and scenic performances. The climax of the show which was big for the time was that in three days 74 gladiators fought. In 105 BC, the ruling consuls offered Rome its first taste of state-sponsored barbarian combat, demonstrated by gladiators from Capua, as part of a training program for the military. It proved immensely popular. The Ludi, sponsored by the ruling elite and dedicated to a deity such as Jupiter, a divine or heroic ancestor began to include the gladiator contests formerly restricted to private munera. Peak by the closing years of the politically and socially unstable late Republic, gladiator games provided their sponsors with extravagantly expensive but effective opportunities for self-promotion while offering cheap, exciting entertainment to their clients. Gladiators became big business for trainers and owners, for politicians on the make and those who had reached the top. A politically ambitious privatures might postpone his deceased father's moonus to the election season, when a generous show might drum up votes. Those in power and those seeking it needed the support of the plebeians and the tribunes whose votes might be won with an exceptionally spectacular show, sometimes even the mere promise of one. Sulla, during his term as praetor, showed his usual acumen in breaking his own sumptuary laws to give the most lavish munus yet seen in Rome. On occasion of his wife's funeral, ownership of gladiators or a gladiator school gave muscle and flair to Roman politics. In 65 BC, newly elected curial edel Julius Caesar topped Sulla's display with games he justified as Munus to his father, who had died 20 years before. 
Despite an already enormous personal debt, he used 320 gladiator pairs in silvered armor. He had wanted more but the nervous senate, mindful of the recent Spartacus revolt, fearful of Caesar's burgeoning private armies and even more fearful of his overwhelming popularity, imposed a limit of 320 pairs as the maximum number of gladiators a citizen could keep in Rome. Caesar's showmanship was unprecedented not only in scale and expense but in putting aside a republican tradition of Munera as funeral offerings. The practical differences between Ludi and Munera were beginning to blur. Gladiatorial games, usually linked with beast shows, spread throughout the Republic and beyond. Anti-corruption laws of 65 and 63 BC attempted but signally failed to curb their political usefulness to sponsors. Following Caesar's assassination and the Roman Civil War, Augustus assumed imperial authority over the games, including Munera and formalized their provision as a civic and religious duty. His revision of sumptuary law capped private and public expenditure on Munera, claiming to save the Roman elite from the bankruptcies they would otherwise suffer, and restricted their performance to the festivals of Saturnalia and Quinquatria. Henceforth, the ceiling costs for a pre-tours, economical, but official munus of a maximum 120 gladiators was to be 25,000 denarii. Generous, imperial ludi might cost no less than 180,000 denarii. Throughout the empire, the greatest and most celebrated games would now be identified with the state-sponsored imperial cult which furthered public recognition, respect and approval for the emperor, his law, and his agents. Between 108 and 1009 AD, Trajan celebrated his dash and victories using a reported 10,000 gladiators over 123 days. The cost of gladiators and Munera continued to spiral out of control. Legislation of 177 AD by Marcus Aurelius did little to stop it, and was completely ignored by his son, Commodus. Decline The decline of the Munus was a far from straightforward process. The crisis of the 3rd century imposed increasing military demands on the imperial purse, from which the Roman Empire never quite recovered and lesser magistrates found the obligatory munera an increasingly unrewarding tax on the doubtful privileges of office. Still, emperors continued to subsidize the games as a matter of undiminished public interest. In the early 3rd century AD, the Christian writer Tertullian had acknowledged their power over the Christian flock, and was compelled to be blunt. The combats were murder, their witnessing spiritually and morally harmful and the gladiator an instrument of pagan human sacrifice. In the next century, Augustine deplored the youthful fascination of his friend Olypius, with the Munera spectacle as inimical to a Christian life and salvation. Amphitheaters continued to host the spectacular administration of imperial justice. In 315 Constantine the first condemned child snatches at bestias in the arena. Ten years later, he banned the gladiator Munera. In times in which peace and peace relating to domestic affairs prevail bloody demonstrations displease us. Therefore, we order that there may be no more gladiator combats. Those who were condemned to become gladiators for their crimes are to work from now on in the mines. Thus they pay for their crimes without having to pour their blood. An imperially sanctioned munus at some time in the 330s suggests that yet again, imperial legislation to Kirk the games proved ineffective, not least when Constantine defied his own law. In 365, Valentinian I threatened to fine a judge who sentenced Christians to the arena and in 384 he attempted, like most of his predecessors, to limit the expenses of Munera. In 393, Theodosius adopted Nicene Christianity as the state church of the Roman Empire and banned pagan festivals. The Ludi continued, very gradually shorn of their stubbornly pagan Munera. Honorius Liga ended Munera in 399, and again in 404, at least in the western half of the empire according to Theodot. 
because of the martyrdom of Saint Telemachus by spectators at Amunus. Valentinian III repeated the ban in 438, perhaps effectively, though Venationus continued beyond 536. By this time, the popularity of Munera had waned, unlike the theatrical shows, and the chariot races which, at least in the Eastern Empire, continued to attract the crowds, and a generous imperial subsidy. It is not known how many gladiatoria munera were given throughout the Roman period. Many, if not most, involved Venationists, and in the later empire some may have been only that. In the early imperial era, the attested munera given by local politicians in Pompeii and neighboring towns were dispersed from March to November. They included a provincial magnate's five-day munus of 30 pairs, plus beast hunts. One single late primary source, the calendar of Furius Dionysius Philocalus for 354, survives to suggest how the gladiator featured among a multitude of official festivals in the late empire period. In that year, 176 days were reserved for spectacles of various kinds. If these 102 days were for theatrical shows, 64 for chariot races and just 10 in December for gladiator games and venationness, Thomas Wiedemann interprets this in the much earlier context of the Historia Augusta, in which Alexander Severus was said to intend the redistribution of Munera throughout the year. This would have broken with the traditional positioning of the major gladiator games at the year's end. As Wiedemann points out, December was the month for Saturnalia, the festival in which the lowest became the highest, and in which death was linked to renewal types. The trade in gladiators was empire-wide, and subjected to official supervision. Rome's military success produced a supply of soldier prisoners who were redistributed for use in state mines or amphitheaters and for sale on the open market. For example, in the aftermath of the Jewish revolt, the gladiator schools received an influx of Jews. Those rejected for training would have been sent straight to the arenas as noxia. The best, the most robust, were sent to Rome. The training as gladiators would give them opportunity to redeem their honor in the Munus. Two other sources of gladiators, found increasingly during the Principate and the relatively low military activity of the Pax Romana, were slaves condemned to the arena, to gladiator schools or games as punishment for crimes, and paid volunteers who by the late Republic may have comprised approximately half, and possibly the most capable half, of all gladiators. The use of volunteers had a precedent in the Iberian Munus of Scipio Africanus but none of those had been paid. For Romans, gladiator would have meant a schooled fighter, sworn and contracted to a master. For the poor, and for non-citizens, enrollment in a gladiator school offered a trade, regular food, housing of sorts and a fighting chance of fame and fortune. Gladiators customarily kept their prize money and any gifts they received, and these could be substantial. Tiberius offered several retired gladiators 100,000 cestuses each to return to the arena. Nero gave the gladiator spiculous property and residence, equal to those of men who had celebrated triumphs. Mark Antony promoted gladiators to his personal guard. Women from the 60s AD female gladiators appear as exotic markers of exceptionally lavish spectacle. In 66 AD, Nero had Ethiopian women, men and children fight her to Munus to impress King Tiridates I of Armenia. Romans seem to have found the idea of a female gladiator novel and entertaining, or downright absurd. Juvenal titillates his readers with a woman named Mevia, hunting boy in the arena, with spear in hand and breast exposed, and Petronius mocks the pretensions of a rich, low-class citizen, whose munus includes a woman fighting from a cart or chariot. A munus of 89 AD, during Domitian's reign, featured a battle between female gladiators and dwarfs. In Halicarnassus, a 2nd century AD relief depicts two female combatants named Amazon and Achelia. Their match ended in a draw. 
In the same century, an epigraph praises one of Ostia's local elite as the first to arm women in the history of its games. Female gladiators probably submitted to the same regulations and training as their male counterparts. Roman morality required that all gladiators be of the lowest social classes, and emperors who failed to respect this distinction earned the scorn of posterity. Cassius Dio takes pains to point out that when the much-admired emperor Titus used female gladiators, they were of acceptably low class. Some regarded female gladiators as a symptom of corrupted Roman sensibilities, morals and womanhood, regardless of class. Before he became emperor, Septimius Severus may have attended the Antiochian Olympic Games, which had been revived by the emperor Commodus and included traditional Greek female athletics. His attempt to give Rome a similarly dignified display of female athletics was met by the crowd with ribald chants and catcalls. Probably as a result, he banned the use of female gladiators in 200 AD. Emperors Caligula, Titus, Hadrian, Lucius Verus, Caracalla, Geta and Didius Julianus were all said to have performed in the arena but risks to themselves were minimal. Claudius, characterized by his historians as morbidly cruel and boorish, fought a whale trapped in the harbor in front of a group of spectators. Commentators invariably disapproved of such performances. Commodus was a fanatical participant at the Ludi, much to the shame of the Senate, whom he loathed, and the probable delight of the populace at large. He fought as a secutor, styling himself Hercules Reborn. As a bestiarius, he was said to have killed 100 lions in one day almost certainly from a platform set up around the arena perimeter which allowed him to safely demonstrate his marksmanship. On another occasion, he decapitated a running ostrich with a specially designed dart, carried the bloodied head and his sword over to the senatorial seats and gesticulated as though they were next. He was said to have restyled Nero's colossal statue in his own images, Hercules Reborn, and rededicated it to himself with the inscription, Champion of Secutors, only left-handed fighter to conquer twelve times one thousand men. For this, he drew a gigantic stipend from the public purse.